Okay, so uh, I got about two-thirds of the way through what was supposed to be my first talk, so I think I'm going to try to finish up the first talk and then give you my favorite part of the second talk and, so, uh, and finish within the hour. So just to remind you where we were, we were about to define a projective Anasov transformation, which is a, uh, a specific type of Anasov representation into, P into PSLNR, and the definition starts by the, with the existence of limit maps. So these limit maps are row equivariant continuous maps from the boundary of the group into uh, Rpn minus 1 uh, and into the Grassmannian of n minus 1 planes. And the transversality is just that. If, you have, if you're at two distinct points, then the line associated to x never lies in the plane associated to y. Um, and there's an, one immediate consequence you get of this is that rho of gamma fixes psi rho of gamma plus. Right, so right away you found one eigenline, and in fact you found a second eigenline, rho of gamma also fixes psi rho of gamma minus, where gamma plus and gamma minus, this is the attracting fixed point. of gamma on its boundary. Okay? So right away, we know we have two eigenlines. And if we also assume that our representation is irreducible, then we know that this is an attracting fixed point, and this is a repelling fixed point for the action on the projective plane. And that's another way, if you want to from the point of view of linear algebra, that says that this matrix, rho of gamma, is a proximal matrix. It has a unique eigenline of maximal modulus and a unique eigenline of minimal modulus. Okay, so right away, just from the existence of the limit maps, we have some dynamical information about our representation. Um, and in fact, it's going to turn out that if your representation is irreducible, this is enough to get everything we need. But um, let's talk about sort of the more general situation. And to do that, oh, let me also remind you that we have a GD sig flow. Um, so U gamma is the unit tangent bundle, and then phi t, whoops, was the GD sig flow. And often it's convenient to work up with u gamma tilde, and we can parameterize that as the, the pairs of points in the boundary. Well, you don't want those points to be equal, cross r. So you can think of a pair of points in the boundary as giving you a geodesic in your space m, and gamma is going, and uh, r tells you, the r coordinate tells you where you are on the geodesic, and then you have this flow. So phi t tilde just takes a point x, y, s, and it's the silliest possible flow. It goes to x, y, t plus s, right? So that's, you know, quite a nice flow. At the level of universal cover, this is a very easily described flow. Okay. So now we're going to have to, uh, I'm going to try to unpack some words which I initially found very scary and turns out are not very scary at all when I was first reading about Anasov representations. Now what they, they always start by saying, take the flat bundle over the Gisic flow determined by the representation. And you know, I don't know, I mean, I guess those of you educated in Europe probably don't find that scary. But <laughs> for me this sounds disturbing, but Strictly less, strictly less than zero. So here, yeah, M was a closed, negatively curved, closed manifold, and the curvature is strictly less than zero, right? So in particular, this GSIC flow is a Nossov, which means it has a direction parallel to the flow, a contracting direction, and an expanding direction. Okay, so what is the flat bundle associated to a representation? Well, you just take this G -sig, this cover the G flow, U gamma tilde, ah, and this is 
to be even more explicit, remember this was just the unit tangent bundle of the universal cover of M. It was not some weird object. And then you cross it with Rn, and then you let the group, it acts on the Dedecic flow just by the, action, by the group of covering transformations of U gamma uh, tilde over U gamma, and it acts on Rn by the representation. So here you have an action of gamma on, what is my notation, U gamma tilde cross Rn, and then it just takes a point. So if you have gamma, it takes a point Z and a vector T to the point gamma of Z and the vector rho gamma of V. That's all it is. And then we quotient out by that action, and we get what's called the flat bundle associated to the representation. Okay. Um, and then it turns out these transverse limit maps just give you a splitting of that flat bundle. And what does that mean? That means you get a, oops, sorry. You get a line bundle and you get a hyperplane bundle. Well, what's the line bundle? Well, let's work again up in this cover. And the line bundle over the point x, y, t, well, what's the line associated to x, y, t? Well, take psi rho of x. That's a line. Okay, so that gives you a line bundle and then... Uh, the hyperplane associated to y to x, y, t is just going to be theta rho of y. Okay, so you have a natural, since psi rho of x and theta rho of y give you a splitting of Rn, this gives you a splitting of your Rn bundle into a line bundle and a hyperplane bundle. And this is all being done equivariantly, so we can work up at this cover level and just quotient out later. As long as everything we did was equivariant, we just quotient out. Yeah. Why? Yeah, these are these are these are not these are not smooth bundles. They're just bundles. They'll have, the the old, the, old, the natural class of smoothness here is Helder. So, um, right. So if you're Finnish, you know Helder is like you know analytic. But for the most of the rest of us, Helder is like continuous. <laughs> right. Um, right. So these are not that well behaved um, from a regularity viewpoint. But they are Helder. Okay? And then, uh, then they say, okay, take the flow, uh, and then they say take the flow parallel to the flat connection on the flat bundle. And that seems even scarier, but in fact, it's something very simple. <laughs> you lift, you take your flow on the unit tangent bundle, and you lift it up to a flow here on U gamma tilde. And then what is the lifted flow to the flat bundle? <laughs> well, at the level of this cover, you just act by the way the flow does. So you've got, a, you've got a decomposition of your lift of your flat bundle into U gamma tilde cross Rn. And in the U gamma tilde factor, you just flow. You take X, Y, S to X, Y, S plus T. And what do you do in the other factor? Nothing. You just leave the vector fixed. So it's the stupid flow, right? It's, it's not some really bizarre flow, but up at the level of your cover, you're just flowing along in the base, and then you're doing nothing in the fiber. Now, of course, then when you project, you look at the action of gamma on this, it's getting twisted by the action of rho of gamma when you go downstairs, but up in the universal cover, it's the silliest possible flow and the easiest possible flow to understand. So this is the flow parallel to the flat connection. And that by construction, this flow preserves the splitting. Because as you flow along uh, in, in time, your x vector doesn't change, so therefore your line doesn't change. If your vector started in your line, your vector doesn't change, so your vector stays in your line. And the same thing with your, your hyperplane. So this gives you, in fact, a flow uh, uh, defined on psi and a flow defined on theta. Okay. So the actual definition of being projective out in Ossoff is you have, a, you, have a, you have a flow, you have a bundle psi, you have a bundle theta. You can, find a new, you can define a new bundle, psi tensor theta star, which is hom uh, theta psi. Uh, and you say, well, this flow should be contracting on this complicated bundle. 
And so now if you do a little bit of tensor manipulation, you see right away, and I'm about to, on the next slide I'm going to give you a really concrete way of saying this without all that tensor analysis. But for the moment, you know, it's just sort of abstract nonsense. And in particular, it says the flow is contracting on psi. Well, let's think about what does that mean for the flow to be contracting on psi? Um, what that means is that you take some norm on E rho. So what does that mean? So that means you get, you, this lifts to a norm on E rho tilde, which is just U gamma tilde cross Rn. And that's just a continuous fam, ver, continuously varying family of norms on Rn. That's all it is. For each point, I have a norm on Rn, and it varies continuously, and it's equivariant with respect to the action. So if you act by rho of gamma, if you, act up, if you act by gamma, then the norm here changes by the action of rho of gamma. Okay, so what does it mean for the flow to be contracting um, for this eigenline? So let's look at what happens to psi rho of gamma plus. So let's take some vector v in psi rho of gamma plus, and so and let let t gamma be the period of the flow line associated to um, gamma. So that means that if you, right, so that means if you look at what is the uh, flow associated to gamma, it's you sit over gamma plus, gamma minus, cross R, up in your cover, that line is preserved flow line in U gamma associated, well, flow line. Let's use better language than flow line. A better word is closed orbit. What? Oh, yeah. That was keeping me awake. I was probably keeping you awake. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Oh, I'll work at a... I'll try to talk in a dull monotone. A nice, peaceful voice so we can all slumber. Anyway, um, so what does that mean? Um, Let's, let's think about this really concretely. That says that now if you flow phi t, t gamma of V, that just gets taken to V. So if you, so let, uh, and let Z be the point gamma plus gamma minus zero, and let's try to break this down, you have a point z in your uh, u gamma tilde, and then you have a vector v, and if you flow along there, this just goes to phi t gamma of z comma v, and phi t gamma of z is equivalent to z, so this is equal to gamma of z, comma v. So what does contracting mean? Well, that means that if you look at the norm of v, measured at the point v hat T gamma of z, that that norm is less than the norm of v measured at the point um, z. Okay? But we said that this point is um, 
right? So this point is, ex is exactly gamma of z, right? So what does this tell you? Well, if you look at it, that this tells you that phi t gamma of v at phi t of z is exactly equal to 1 over lambda 1 of rho gamma of v at z, right? Because this norm is supposed to be rho equivariant. And so what does this rho do? Rho takes v. That says that the v at z has the same norm as rho gamma of v at gamma of z. Right, that's, what rho, that's what the rho equivariance is. And so that tells you, but, but rho gamma of v is exactly lambda 1 rho gamma of v. So that tells us that, um, let me write some of this down, since I got myself a v at z is supposed to equal to rho of gamma of v at gamma of z. And this is exactly equal to lambda 1 rho gamma of v measured at v t hat of uh, v t of z. Okay? So that says, that when you rearrange that, you can pull the lambda 1 out and you get this thing. So that says that this is equal to 1 over lambda 1 rho gamma times v at z. So that tells you, when you look at it, that tells you lambda 1 is bigger than 1. Right? So, um, well, that doesn't... Okay, why well, that, that didn't get us very far. So lambda 1 is bigger than 1. We felt like we knew that already. <laughs> um, but even more, now if you have a contracting flow on a compact space, it's not only contracting, it's uniformly contracting. So if you have a flow which is contracting on a compact space, at any point if you flow for some amount of time, you contract by a factor of 1 half. But that varies continuously, and you're on a compact space. So there's some time t naught that if you start at any point and you flow for time t naught, you contract by one half. And so now if you contract, so now if you flow for time 18 times two, two naught, 18 times t naught, you contract by a factor of one over two to the 18th. Right? So this is uniform contraction, follows from compactness. U gamma compact implies contraction is um, uniform, i.e., that um, the norm at of V hat T of V at phi T of Z is less than C times E to the negative A T times the norm of V at Z. So it's being contracted by some exponential factor A. And so what that tells you is that, in fact, um, this contract, if we put this all together, I put it, should have probably put this all on the slides. I just decided at the last minute this would be a good thing to do. Um, so if we put this all together, that tells us that the norm of V at phi T gamma of Z is less than or equal to C E to the negative A T gamma times the norm of V at Z. Okay, so and if we play around, this implies lambda 1 rho gamma is bigger 
then 1 over C times um, E times A to the T gamma. Okay? Oops. But what about T gamma? So you've got a compact space and you're flowing on it. So what is, what is the relationship between the, flow, the, the period of the flow and the word length? Well, they've got to be uh, related to one another. If you take the universal cover of the flow and you take the uh, group, then those two are quasi-symmetric. And so you know that T gamma is comparable to gamma, and this is the reduced word length. So reduced word length, you can define it a bunch of ways. One is saying it's the minimal length of a word conjugate to gamma. Another way to say it is it's the translation length of gamma on its Cayley graph. So this is, let's take that. This is translation length of gamma on its Cayley graph. So I'm, I'll, you know, up to choosing a constant, I'm, I'm allowed to replace T gamma with reduced word length. And since, you know, again, we don't care about constants. We're, we're coarse geometers today. So this implies that um, lambda 1 of rho gamma, which is this top value, is bigger than 1 over some constant e to the negative k times the reduced word length. And so that implies that the log of lambda 1 of rho gamma is bigger than some constant times the word length minus c. And this should sound familiar to us. So think about back to Fuchsian groups. What is, what is the log of the top eigenvalue? Well, it's, ha it's half the translation length, right, <laughs> on H2. So this is sort of saying that if you have a Fuchsian group, the translation length grows roughly the, the, as fast as the word length. And so we're seeing that same fact now transported up into this abstract setting of uh, projective and Ossoff groups. They have this same property, that translation length, where we're, tr where we're interpreting translation length, this log of the top eigenvalue is, is roughly word length. And this has a fancy name. It's called well-displacing. So a representation into PSLNR is well-displacing if log of the, another, and a fancy name for lambda 1 is the spectral radius, which is another thing, you know, another thing that used to confuse me at first, that I had to teach myself that spectral radius meant top eigenvalue. So the log of the top eigenvalue is at least k times the word length minus c. Okay. Um, so here's a, and here's the more concrete formulization, formula, formalization of this bundle hom theta, theta psi is contracting. You can just say that if you put any norm on your flat bundle and you take any point in the, in the, uh, <laughs> in the uh, geodesic flow, any vector in the line bundle at that point and any vector w in the hyperplane bundle at that point and you flow, and you, you flow for time t naught, then uh, you look at the ratio of the length of V over the length of W with respect to this norm, it's contracted by a factor of one half. So you can see that this right away, if we didn't know before that lambda one is the top eigenvalue, this tells you that this vec the vectors in psi are growing faster than any of the other vectors. So this tells you that definitely that lambda one is the eigenvalue of maximum modulus. Okay, and so in fact we could have given this definition, but I wanted to at least put this sort of uh, fancy definition up there. But this is totally equivalent to that. Okay. So once you have something which is well displacing, well this also turns out to be in this setting equivalent 
to your orbit map being a quasi-symmetric quasi quasi -isometric embedding. Well, why is that? Well, the log of the top eigenvalue is coarsely the translation distance on the symmetric space. Okay, so this tells you that the translation distance on the symmetric space is roughly comparable to word length. And so if you think about it, you know, your Cayley graph is getting embedded in your space. Your Cayley graph is full of axes, and each axis is quasi-isometrically embedded because the translation distance in the axis is roughly the translation distance in the, distance in the symmetric space. So we recovered the fact that our orbit map is a quasi-isometric embedding from this sort of abstract definition. And remember, that was something we definitely wanted to be true. We wanted to look at representations which, had, which were quasi-isometric embeddings, but we... Uh, we realized that wasn't quite enough. So this is a strengthening of that condition. Okay. And again, we saw that if you're a quasi-isometric embedding, you've got to be discrete because your orbit can't accumulate, and you've got to be faithful because your orbit can't pile up at any one point. Okay. So as a summary, we've got this definition of a projective and offset representation. It guarantees we're discrete and faithful. It guarantees we're well displacing. And the associated orbit map is a quasi-isometric embedding. And the image of every element is biproximal. So that, you should think of the image of every element being biproximal as being, so if you're used to uh, rank one Lie groups, if you have a representation which is convex co-compact, that means the image of every element is a hyperbolic transformation. It can't be elliptic or parabolic. So this is sort of a generalization of that fact. It's that every element has to be biproximal. Um, and one thing which I don't have on here, I should, but is uh, I certainly don't want to prove, is one advantage of this definition is this definition is in terms of dynamics. So this says that we have hyperbolic dynamics. And one of the really crucial things about hyperbolic dynamics is they're stable. If you wiggle a hyperbolic dynamical system, it remains a hyperbolic dynamical system in a very broad setting. So, um, in fact, this setup is set up exactly so that you can now sort of mimic the sort of technology you see that goes back to like Hirsch, Pugh, and Schub's book and prove that, um, and in fact, another formulation of this is that there's a section of the flat bundle whose image is a hyperbolic with respect to the flow, whose image is a hyperbolic set. Um, well, yeah, anyway. Maybe you have to be a little more careful about that, but something, there's something like that is true. So you know that if you take a bundle and you wiggle it a little bit, and if your original bundle had a section whose image was a hyperbolic set, your wiggled bundle also has a, has a section whose a hyperbolic set. So that tells you that if you wiggle a projective and Ossoff transformation, it remains projective and Ossoff. And there are now many definitions available uh, of, of an Ossoff representations. And one of the real advantages of this is of this one is that it's set up to very, in a very, to, to apply to very standard uh, technology to give you stability. I think that's one of the things that Labrie was thinking about when he made this definition. Okay, so let's see what, 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 what this means in a couple of our examples. Well, let's think about these Benoit representations. Remember, I told you that if you take a, 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 a lattice, a, a co-compact uh, subgroup of SON1, and you wiggle it within PSL n plus 1, it remains, so, so the original lattice preserves some round disk, and the new one, Benoit proved, it preserves some convex domain. So if you take this wiggling rho t from gamma into PSL n plus 1 r, you started with rho naught from gamma into SON1. So I'm going to draw in the picture where n is 2 here. Then you get this omega t, and this is C1, strictly convex. And rho t uh, preserves. Rho t of gamma preserves. Omega of t. Um, 
So this is kind of amazing that it stays C1, remember. It does not stay at all C1 if we do the same thing in the rank 1 setting. Um, but so now what is our limit map? Well, here you have an action on this space. This guy admits a complete metric called the Hilbert metric. And so you can just like when you take the hyperbolic metric on H2, naturally the boundary of H2 is its boundary circle. When you take the Hilbert metric on this guy, naturally its boundary circle is the boundary of this domain. So you get an identification. Psi rho goes from boundary gamma to the boundary of this domain. Okay, And one thing you should be careful with is this identification is not C1, it's only Helder, even though this boundary is C1. So it's like if you have two Fuchsian groups, and if you take and you conjugate one to the other, that limit map is only Helder. In fact, it can't be differentiable at any point. <laughs> so this is something you often see in this higher type mirror theory setting. The image of your limit map may very well be a nice, smooth object, but your limit map itself is not smooth, and you have that can be very important. And so, but what now? What's theta of rho? So here's psi rho of x. What should theta rho of x be? Well, we have a C1 submanifold. There's a hyperplane staring us in the face. All right, the tangent line. That's theta rho of x. Theta rho of x is just tangent plane. To omega t, right? So, this, so these two transverse limit maps are staring us right in the face. And what is the transversality? It exactly reflects the fact that I told you this was strictly convex. So if you if you unravel what strict convexity means, it right away implies transversality. Okay. So you can see, sort of, in this work of Benoit, which is done about the same time as Labrie's work, a lot of the ideas of an Ossoff representation are just very naturally occurring. Okay. Well, what about these Hitchin representations? What Labrie proves is that, in fact, they're even they're a stronger kind of a Nossov. They're a Nossov with respect to a minimal parabolic. So if rho is Hitchin, Labrie shows you get maybe psi hat rho, which goes from the boundary of gamma into the space of flags on Rn. So a flag is a line, a two-plane, a three-plane, a four-plane, all the way up to an n minus one plane. And then, so once you have this, you of course have limit maps into Rpn minus one. You just take the first factor, and then the last factor is a map into the Grassmannian of n minus one planes. So the projective Anasov property is just sort of like a restriction of this, the existence of this limit map. Okay. Um, and another sort of setting which we haven't talked about, but we've talked about ping, various people have talked about ping pong. And going back to Teats, you can play ping pong in SLNR. And if you start with a, bi, with a finite collection of biproximal elements, which are sort of in general position, which means that the attracting line of one should never lie in the repelling hyperplane of the other. Then, if you pass to high enough powers, the thing they generate is projective Anasov, and if you, you can play ping pong on the RPN minus one, and that ping pong construction produces a cantor set. And that cantor set is just the, Im is, is just the image of the limit map. So all that stuff is playing toward you if you want, and if you want to get the map into the Grassmannian of N minus one planes, you just work on uh, uh, the dual projective space, <laughs> which you can identify with. And you, the projective space of Rn dual is naturally the Grassmannian. So you can sort of use this duality and win. So there's these various examples. OK, and so now if you start with a generous, general semi-simple Lie group and a pair of opposite parabolic subgroups. So in SLNR, that might, might mean P plus is the stabilizer of a partial, partial flag and then P minus the stabilizer of a dual flag. So in our case, P plus was the stabilizer of a line, and P minus is the stabilizer of a hyperplane. And then your limit maps go into the associated flag spaces, G mod P plus and G mod P minus. 
G PSLN R minus the stabilizer of a line is exactly R P N minus one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you can do this whole formalism. I think I'm going to skip over this. Um, but you can you know, talk about the Anasov section of the flow. And this is a little slightly different formulation, but it's really morally the same thing. So you can do a bunch more examples. So for instance, if you're, you can redo the rank one theory. And if the rank one theory, the only parabolic subgroups, there's just one of them up to conjugacy. And that's just um, the fixed point of a point in the boundary. Right? So in PSL2C, this is just the set of upper triangular matrices. This is another thing that really bothered me coming from rank one. The parabolic subgroup does not consist of parabolic elements. Still, still troubling to me. <laughs> it contains all elements which fix infinity. Right, so the set of the upper triangular matrices, you can think of this as all isometries of H3 preserving the point in infinity. Okay? And then it turns out to be a Nosov is exactly equivalent to being convex co-compact. So there, we've done nothing new. We just have some fancy formalism for thinking about the objects we had before. But it tells you that this is this is, again, more confirmation. This is the right way to generalize convex co-compact representations. If you're generalizing convex co-compact representations and you restrict to PSL2C, you better get convex co-compact things, or you probably don't have the right generalization. Um, and the Hitchin representations are Nosov with respect to the, uh, the set of upper triangular matrices, which is the minimal parabolic subgroup of PSLNR. Uh, another example. Another thing which I would guess is an example, though I, I don't know for sure, is we saw in uh, Pepe's second talk that he constructed these mirror Schottky groups. And these uh, limit set was a Cantor set of projective lines in CP3. Well, what is that? That, should, that Cantor set should be, a, so that means they should be a Nosov with respect to a stabilizer of a two-plane in C4, and uh, then your limit map would naturally go into the space of projective lines in CP3, right? Which is G mod P plus in that setting. So maybe that's an example too. Just uh, it's sort of striking to me that so that probably should be an example. But then there's also this theorem of Guichard and Wienhard, which which I've leaned on heavily in my own work, which says that in the end you can always think just think about projective Anasov transformations. I mean, you start with any old Lie group, and you start with any old parabolic subgroup. Then you get some representation called the Pluker embedding of your group into PSLNR. And a representation from gamma into G is a Nosov if and only if eta composed rho is projective a Nosov. So in some sense, you can, if you don't, you know, if you're scared of your current Lie group, just embed your Lie group in SLNR in the right way, and you can work there. And so this is actually a, a, a trick which they make extensive use of in their work. It's quite powerful. Um, and you get all these very general things. With this general definition, the representation of discrete faithful, they're quasi-isometrics, the, the uh, images of each element is proximal, whatever that means with respect to your parabolic subgroup. Um, they're stable, and the action of outer automorphism group is properly discontinuous. Oh, I forgot to say, when we proved well-displacing, if you think about Francois's proof of Fricke's theorem, the mapping class group acts properly discontinuously on Teichmuller space, he exactly used the fact that your, um, your uh, representations are well-displacing. That if you if you sort of strip it down, that that was the whole proof, and then and then a little group theoretic fact about about that. The group theoretic fact was that you can have a finite collection of curves whose length determine your representation, right? So you put those two facts together, you have a proof of proper discontinuity, and well, that proof generalizes to show that the outer automorphism group of any hyperbolic group acts properly discontinuously on any. Um, uh, group of an, any space of Anasov representations. So, sort of another, another nice confirmation that what we know from the rank one world continues onward. Is there any difference between well displacing and properly discontinuous? Yeah, sure. If, even in. Um, no, what is it? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. So, well displacing says translation length grows like word length. 
So if you have a parabolic element, that right away fails. Translation length, zero. The translation length of the square is zero. The translation length of the third power is zero. So the translation length is growing like zero, and, and the word length is growing linearly. So they're not growing at the same rate. Or, yeah, well displacing is, implies discrete faithful. Yeah. And properly is continuous, yeah. Well, if you think about it, suppose you have a sequence of things. Suppose you're indiscrete. That means that there's some orbit accumulating at the origin. Orbit of the origin, accumulating the origin. So then you have an infinite collection of elements which are moving the origin smaller and smaller amounts. So you have an infinite sequence of elements whose translation lengths are converging to zero. Well, the word length of those elements is going to infinity and their translation lengths going to zero. That's bad. <laughs> or, but it, it's, so it's even stronger. So in, in particular, it implies, pl implies every group element is hyperbolic in the rank one setting, but it's stronger than that. So if you think about, um, uh, for, it's, it's a, well, this placing is equivalent to convex co-compact is what it is in the rank one setting. What? Yes. Yeah, so there's a paper by uh, Guichard, Delzant, Moses, Moses, and Laboury doing that. It's an awful lot of higher fi firepower for that result, but they do, they do have a very general discussion of the relationship between quasi-isometric and well-displacing. It's in Bob Zimmer's birthday thing. Okay, so, or if you take uh, these fiber subgroup of a three-manifold fibering over the circle, this is an example. Every element is hyperbolic, but yet it's not well-displacing because it's not a quasi-isometric embedding. Okay. And um, now there are a number of different definitions. So one thing I should say is, is we leaned on the fact that gamma was the fundamental group of a, of a negatively curved manifold to get our geodesic flow, but Gromov has defined a geodesic flow for any hyperbolic group. Um, and it's a little tricky to work with, and then you can make this whole thing go through for arbitrary hyperbolic groups. Um, but there's some definitions now which avoid that by two teams, one Gary Toe, Guichard, Cassell, and Wienhardt, another one Kapovich, Lieb, and Porti, and they both have developed definitions which avoid the use of the geodesic flow, and even definitions which avoid the use of the limit map. So you can sort of look at things. So and these are um, two. So you can, well, Fanny and Francois should feel free to yell at me if I really oversimplify. But to really oversimplify, the work of theirs involves a study of the Cartan projection. And they get, they get um, a criterion in terms of the norm or the growth of the Cartan projection, which I would think of as like some sort of um, hyped up version of the well displacing condition. It's a it's a vast strengthening of the well well displacing condition. Is that fair, Fanny? Okay, good. <laughs> and um, um, whereas the Catfish Lee Porti team, they work in terms of the action directly on the symmetric space. And so they have a very and they look at the action on symmetric space and the action on its teats boundary, etc. So uh, they end up with some similar results but with really different and complementary techniques. Okay. Okay, so let me now do my favorite part of the second talk in 15 minutes, which is um, the second talk was supposed to be about the existence of a metric on higher Teichmuller spaces. And in particular, there's a metric on the Hitchin component whose restriction to uh, the Fuchsian locus is, is the Vey Peterson metric. So it's a generalization of the Vey Peterson metric into the setting of higher Teichmuller spaces. This is joint work with Martin Bridgman, Francois Labrie, and Andre Samborino. And how this work proceeds is we take a higher Teichmuller space, we take a family of representations, and we convert them into a family of flows. And there, these are so the Hitchin component is converted to a family of a family of flows, and each of these flows is a reparameterization of the geodesic flow on a surface. So now we've replaced uh, family representations by a family of flows or a family of reparameterizations of the fixed flows. Ah, but the, the study of 
of families of Anasov flows is exactly the thermodynamic formalism. <laughs> and so now, once we've made this transition from a representation to a flow, we have this huge toolkit called the thermodynamic formalism, and it allows us to uh, do things like to define a metric. So we can talk, this metric in some sense measures how close these, the difference between two representations is going to be sort of like the difference between these two reparameterizations, or the difference between these flows. So um, I'm not going to tell you all about the thermodynamic formalism, but let me tell you how you take a representation and turn it into a flow. And this is a very beautiful idea, which goes back to Andre Sambarino's thesis. Um, and when I learned this, I was just learning all this stuff for the first time, I thought it was one of these ideas that had been around 100 years, because it was so natural. And I couldn't you know, it's like several months later I learned this was his idea. I was quite impressed. <laughs> so, what's the idea of this flow? Super simple. So, I'm going to define, by the way, I'm going to put a, I'm going to post the slides in my second talk if you want to look at it and see the whole thing. But I'm, let me just uh, show you this highlight. So, you define a real bundle over Boundary gamma, boundary gamma cross diagonal. This ought to remind you of that U gamma tilde of the T of the of, of the unit tangent bundle of the of the um, un, of the unit tangent bundle universal cover. It had this structure. It was boundary gamma cross boundary gamma minus diagonal cross R, <laughs> right? So it it should uh, maybe not be so surprising that what I'm going to produce is going to be a reparameterization of the geodesic flow, and now, pi inverse of a point x, y is going to be exactly, well, I want to get a line. Well, but I, my limit map gives me a line. So I'm going to choose a vector v, and I'm going to choose it in psi rho of x. So this is asymmetric, but I could write it more symmetrically, but this symmetric way of writing it is simpler. v in psi rho of x. And I don't want to choose 0, right? And then I'm going to identify v with negative v. So it's a choice of vector in the line bundle up to sign. Or you can think of it as, as a choice of norm on the, on the line, whatever you want. And OK, so what is the flow on this space? Psi t tilde takes the point x, y, v. Well, I don't really know what to do with x and y, so I just leave them fixed. Well, what do you do with, if you have a point in r minus 0, what do you do? We really can only take v to e to the tv or e to the minus tv. Those are like the, almost the only choices for a sensible flow. So here's our flow. Pretty sure it's e to the tv. I always have to think twice before I, <laughs> whether it's e to the minus tv. But those are the only reasonable choices. So we think of this as a flow space where we just flow in this in the in in the line, preserving the line, and this sort of mimics the fact before we were flowing, we we looked at um, x, the flow that takes x y t to x y t plus s. It's sort of the analog of that. Okay, um, now there's an action of gamma on f sub rho, and what does it do if you take some element gamma? of x, y, v, well, gamma acts on the boundary of gamma, and then you take v to rho gamma v. So again, it's acting by the group on the first factor, and it's acting by the representation on the second factor. This should feel familiar. Okay? And the, the fact that this makes sense, this is well defined exactly because psi rho was rho equivariant. <laughs> So the equivariance, the limit map coming on here. And then the and so now what I want to do is I want to quotient out. But the problem is I don't know right away that my action is nice. So it turns out that what I first do is show that I've reproduced a, 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 I've produced a parameterization of the GSIG flow. And once I show that, then I know the action is proper and co-compact. So a little lemma you can show, and it's not hard. I'm not going to do it for you. We don't have time. But there exists a gamma invariant, or gamma equivariant would be a better way of saying it. 
and it's going to be helder. Again, that's just the natural setting. If you're used to hyperbolic dynamics, everything is helder, right? That's, that's the best smoothness for everything. Helder orbit equivalence. Um, yeah. yeah. So what might be interesting is the question is the, the Helder exponent feels like it behaves a little bit like the Hausdorff dimension of the limit set. But there's, there's some results like that, but that's, yeah. G tilde from, yeah, it's uh, in its infancy. It's in its infancy. So there's a, Helder orbit equivalence means it's a homeomorphism which preserves orbits. It doesn't preserve the flow. I mean, if you're, you know, so that, so it preserves the flow lines, but it doesn't preserve the flow. Okay? So you can write this down. You clearly, at the levels of your cover, you're going to take x to x, you're going to take y to y, and then you've got to choose how, how to map t to v, right? So you just have to write down a form. You can write down a formula for it. It's not that hard. Um, so once you've got that, that implies that gamma's action on F sub rho is proper and co-compact. So that implies that you can define, you get an orbit equivalence between u gamma and u rho, which is F rho modded out by gamma. So this is an orbit equivalence. And then, it's a general theory that if you have two flows, to, so if this flow is, is a Nossov, <laughs> so if you have two, so if this flow is a Nossov, then also this flow will be a Nossov. And then, um, uh, if you have two Nossov flows which are orbit equivalent, one, it turns out, is a reparameterization of the other. So now you know um, that, that, in fact, this is a reparameterization. That you can replace this by not not you can find, to use g to construct a function f, which is to say that u rho is the reparameterization of u gamma by f. Okay, and so right, and it also another nice thing here is if you know if you start off with the Gromov geodesic flow. And uh, then you don't know that's a Nossov. You don't have this theory of negligible curve manifolds. You, you don't know you have an, a, a Nossov flow even in the metric set, metric sense. But it turns out you can take this construction and use the Nossov property of the limit maps to prove that this flow, F sub rho, is metric Nossov. So this tells you something about the dynamics that tells you the Gromov geodesic flow of a group which admits that a Nossov representation is a Nossov, which is something we didn't know before and which we don't know whether that's true for a general hyperbolic group. So there's something special about these hyperbolic groups which are occurring here. Um, no, not natural. No, it's just Helder. It's just Helder, yeah. yeah. You know, you can write, you can sort of write down, you do an averaging procedure, right? So the point is, you know, if you end up with something which is reparameterization by a Holder function, it's differentiable in the direction of, of the flow. But this map, we don't start out knowing it's differentiable in the direction of flow. So it's a little bit of, there's a little bit of abstract abstract dynamical systems, which is allowing us to make an upgrade in regularity using the Anosovness. It uses the Anosovness in a crucial way. So, so, so rho give, gives rise to u sub rho, and there exist f sub rho such that u sub rho is f sub rho such that u sub rho is u gamma reparameterized by f sub rho. So now what we get, we get a map, <laughs> so for instance of the Hitchin space, Hn of s goes into 
the space of Helder functions on U gamma. <laughs> right? Um, so you start with a representation and you end up with a positive Helder function defined on the flow space. Okay, and then there's also something called uh, the pressure function, which, which is associated to the flow. And there's a little fact that P is analytic. And uh, P of negative H rho equals zero, if and only if uh, H is the topological entropy. What? Yeah, yeah, right. This is this 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 whole. So, for people from the may be familiar from the rank one world, Ruel showed that the Hausdorff dimension of the limit set of a quasi Fuchsian proof varies analytic of a quasi Fuchsian group varies analytically. This is a so this whole project is a big jump up of that. <laughs> so it H is the topological entropy. So this is an analytic function. This tells you that. Once you can show that F rho varies analytically, which again is a nasty exercise in the hirsch pieschub technology, then you can show that the topological entropy of this flow varies analytically. But what is the topological entropy of a flow? It's exactly the exponential growth rate of the number of orbits of length t. So you take the log of the number of orbits of, of length at most t and divide by t and pass the limit. And the fact that the limit exists at all, normally you just have to take limb soup. The fact the limit exists at all follows from being a Nossoff. Um, so the topological entropy H is equal to um, number of uh, limit T goes to infinity. You divide by T on the top, you take the log and you take the number of orbits of u rho of length less than t. So you can equivalently, uh, that's going to be roughly the length of the number of closed GD6 in the quotient symmetric space of length less than t. And then there's some very famous work of Sullivan, which says the topolo this topological entropy in the rank one case is just the Hausdorff dimension of the limit set. So one thing that comes out of this is um, that if you take any analytically varying family of convex co-compact representations into any rank one Lie group, the Hausdorff dimension of the limit set varies analytically. So this was previously only known for surface groups in PSL2C and free groups in PSL2C and free products of surface groups and free groups, PSL2C. And Samuel Tapie, I believe, proved it with C1 in a fairly general setting. I'm not sure how general. But this is, uh, right. So right away, before we even getting to define the metric, just at this place, we've got analyticity of everything. Analyticity sort of everywhere. Um, yeah, and this is just, and this is coming out of the thermodynamic formula. This is just start. So now, now we start hitting the thermodynamic formalizing formalism hard. It turns out that the space of pressure zero functions admits a, uh, a semi norm, which is po uh, a positive semi norm or a non negative semi norm, and we just pull that back by this mapping. <laughs> so we pull back. From this, we take from here, we go in. This gives us a mapping of the space of pressure zero functions. We have a form here. We pull that form here back onto the Hitchin component, and we then have to show that it's positive definite. So that's nasty. When you want to show positive definite, it's kind of nasty. It involves a lot of trace identities in the end. Um, and this is all a generalization, also a generalization of Thurston's idea that the Vey Peterson metric. Um, should be the Hessian of the length of a random GD sick. <laughs> so it, it, it general it start that's another starting point for this whole thing. But I better stop. <laughs>